Hello. Good evening, everyone. Are you with us? How ridiculous. On my to hold the phone the other way up. talking about um, strops today and uh, we're going to start that off by considering how to make a strop. I'll start making it today and then we'll come back in the next stream to finish off making it and I'll show you how I use it. And that will probably be on a Wednesday evening at the same time, 7 o'clock. Uh, if there are any changes to that then you'll know when I publish that stream information which should be by tomorrow evening, so 24 hours beforehand. Uh, after we've done that, I'm going to change focus onto using dimensioned PAR lumber from DIY stores. And I didn't manage to get to a DIY store because they're all in lockdown here, but I've found something which is very similar. This was used in a bit of packing. It's got all the problems you'd find with timber that comes from a DIY store. So we'll sort that one out and hopefully we'll get through all of that exercise uh, within about 20 to 30 minutes and I'll be taking questions along the way. Uh, my good friend Shrenik is um, chatting with me through the internet and relaying uh, the chat that's going through the stream. So although I can't see your questions very easily from where I'm standing, uh, if anything's pertinent to what I'm actually doing at the time, I should be able to hear that and answer you. Uh, but I will check back with the chat later on just to see if there's anything that I haven't managed to cover. Uh, and if you don't get any questions answered that you want answered uh, in the live stream, just put them in the comments and I'll be checking on those regularly afterwards. So, without further ado, let's move back to strops. If you think about sharpening on... Um, If you think about sharpening on um, stones, uh, diamond plates, that sort of thing, you always end up leaving some sort of scratch pattern and almost always it's slightly visible as well. Well, if you take things to the next level, it's kind of like when you're sanding something and you go through the grit, 60 grit, you know, maybe 120, 240, you can still see the scratch marks, but if you keep stepping it up, eventually you can't see them anymore and uh, you'll get a much smoother surface. Well, with stropping, we're aiming to take a blade, chisel, plain iron, knife, whatever. We'll grind a bevel on it. We'll use some stones to get rid of the grinding marks as much as possible. And then the very last step is we'll use some honing compound on a piece of leather or directly on some MDF, which you can do and then we'll polish the very tip of that blade which will make for far easier cutting. Uh, if it cuts easier you put less effort into your work and you get more accurate results. So that's the reason for doing it. 
The way I like to, to make straps is to use a material that's fairly rigid and is stable and flat. And I've found that MDF is probably the best material. You don't need anything thick, uh, but just use offcut. So if you've got a thick piece, that's fine. Down to about 9mm, which this is, perfectly adequate. Stays flat even if you're just supporting one end and the other end's on the bench. So if, when, if you're working on knives, it can be a lot easier to work holding the strop up at one end. Leathers, I just use scraps from old jackets, belts, etc. I've never had to buy leather for a strop. And you can go from something that's quite stiff and quite thick, that's well over a millimetre in thickness, to something really very stretchy and thin. As long as you adhere it to your base uh, really well, that will be absolutely fine, the thin one. So we'll make sure we get glue all over the surface. Good contact with some cools, plenty of weight on it. Then at least, if all the leather's held tight, it's not going to stretch when you're trying to use it. To show the, the, uh, the range that you can use, this was actually the hem of a jacket, leather jacket. You still see the stitching marks. Just opened out. Fold it back the other way to get rid of most of the crease. It now lays nice and flat, and that's the one I'm going to use. I just use ordinary PVA glue, nothing special here, just some white glue. It is quite thin, so it might make a bit of a mess. We don't really want humps when it's finished, so We'll spread the glue out. The PVA is slightly uh, mobile when it's actually cured, so um, you want to make sure it's as thin as possible. And of course you could use many other types of glue as well. So a good coating of the glue, nicely spread out. Take the leather, I always put the, the rougher side up. So the smoother side down. This is actually a suede, so it hasn't got a shiny side to it, but it's, it's a smoother side. Stretch it out just a little bit. Yeah, um, I've never tried denim, but I have heard it said in the past that it works. And uh, if you don't like animal products, don't want to use leather, absolutely use that. I, I did mention very briefly, you might not have called it at the start, that you can also strop directly on MDF. And uh, that takes away some of the problems that people encounter if they're rounding over edges, um, perhaps thinking that the leather is curling up around the end of the blade and rounding it. If you work on MDF directly, uh, you've got absolutely no flexibility there. So with that on, I put my cool on top, make sure it's covering every part of the underlying base. Just lift off my weight with that and put a heavy weight on top. We'll leave that. Um, I'll probably leave that like that until we come back on uh, Friday, but I will put it somewhere else. Hopefully that's shown you that actually making a strop um, is really simple. There's nothing to it really. There's no reason to pay two, three, four pound for a strop when you can make one literally for a few pence. Okay, any questions on strops before I move on to the dimensioning of PAR? Just a question from me. Uh, why do you put weight on it rather than it? Uh, it's easier. Um, if you've tried to clamp things, I'm sure you find glue slippery. Um, in some cases, you do need the pressure of um, clamps to, to really pull things up tight together like joints. 
here the leather's flat the two surfaces the, the actual base for the strop and the um, the cool that I'm using both nice and flat so really just what this is which is perhaps a kilogram just make sure things stay together until uh, until it's set up but you of course you can clamp it if you've got no weights in fact with a thicker leather like this you could actually just staple it on at each end Okay, uh, that will depend on the metal you've got. Uh, when you finish on um, your finest diamond plate or a water stone or something, depending on the steel you're using, you will either have a burr left or you won't. So with um, things like uh, the modern alloy steels, you often have uh, no burr left at all when you've gone on the fine stone. Um, and work the back. So if this is the, if you've been sharpening the bevel like this, you'll end up with a burr on the back side of the blade. If you turn it over and you just pull off backwards on flat on the back of the blade, that burr will normally just fall off. If you're using uh, high carbon steel, quite often you'll end up with a wire edge burr just sitting on the end, which no matter how many times you work it on the stone backwards and forwards like this it won't come off it just bends slightly one way or the other and in that case when you move over to the strop the strop tends to pull it off a lot easier I have stropped um, some blades and the, the, that wire edge stays on there for good you know, there's just no way it's going to come off and you manually have to pinch it off with your fingers but in most cases the strop will take it off the main reason for using the strop though is for polishing that final little part of the bevel and that can either be at the primary bevel angle so you could just have one angle to your bevel and it would just be polishing the very tip of that or if you put a secondary bevel even a tertiary bevel on there it's just polishing up the, the very tip of that. It makes the difference between a blade which will um, easily cut the hairs off the back of your hand if you had any left I mean basically they'll just ping off when it's dropped whereas coming off a fine diamond stone um, the usual Japanese water stuff, fine stones it won't take the hairs off the back of your hand that easily uh, Japanese water stones do go down to a fineness which is equally as good as using a strop but those stones are uh, very expensive as well so most people have what is considered a, a medium and a fine water stone and in those cases you can improve the finish by using a strop with some polishing compound on it and we'll talk about polishing compound next time basically it's something to apply to the leather uh, which is a very fine abrasive uh, you put it onto the strop and uh, it helps the polish Okay, shall I move on? Okay, thank you very much. Um, next time I get a question, I'll try and repeat it. Try and remember to repeat it so you can all hear it clearly. <coughs> okay, um, I really need a drink. I'm, I must have COVID. I'm coughing a lot today. That's only a joke, I think I'm a joke. So this piece of timber is like a piece of PAR timber you'd pick up in a DIY store. Now I should clarify what PAR is, uh, there was a question about that. PAR basically stands for planed all round, remember correctly, which I think is square four sides. So basically a piece of lumber that's been sawn then goes to um, through the planer and the its thickness both in its width and its uh, in its thickness and its width um, and square edges to faces that's the idea but very clear to see on this one uh, whether you can
catch that on the camera is there are ripples in there from where it's gone through the planer. So you wouldn't want to use that directly in a project. Not unless you wanted a, a ripple texture finish. It really starts before you even get to the DIY store. Uh, break down your project and I would suggest actually if you can find out what sizes are available and bear in mind that the nominal sizes for PAR are actually larger than the material will end up being because the size quoted for the material is before it's been thicknessed. So there's always a bit more material removed. But work your project based roughly on something a little bit smaller than the size is quoted for it. And then when you go to the store, pick out a nice straight timber, piece of timber, and then you'll be able to cut to length or just over length and just a few strokes of a smoothing plane to get rid of those ripples and you're ready to work with it in your project. That's not always uh, possible to do because you may be using or looking for a size that's thinner than anything you can buy. Uh, you may be looking for something that's um, a lot less wide than anything that you can get hold of. And so you're going to need to saw it yourself and we'll cover that a little bit later. So when you go to the um, store, look in the rack at all the different ones there are. Pick out, not just based on looks. Uh, if you're concerned really about the look of the grain, do also take into account whether it's straight. And you do that by sighting down the piece of wood, like so. And you're looking for it to, to shoot off nice and straight down both sides. Uh, in the thickness, it's less likely to be have any bend to it, any curve to it. But worth checking both ways. And also check that there's no cup. So basically a hollow on one side and a hump on the other. Try and avoid all of those defects that you'll find. And what I usually do if I'm using PAR, I'm looking rather for the um, integrity of it uh, than anything else. So I'll be looking for it to be clear of knots and with probably quite a tight grain pattern to it makes it easier to work. If you've got big spaces uh, yeah. big spaces between early and late wood or thicker and thicker areas of early wood. Basically it's going to be lighter and it's not going to be well it probably will be almost as strong but I prefer to go for something with a tighter grain. When you cut this uh, with a, a plane on the end grain, uh, these wider rings are going to roughen up a lot more because the fibres aren't as tight as in a, a nice tightly grained piece of wood. And basically it's just more difficult to work, I find, with something like this. Also if you're chopping with it, um, your chisel is going to go through a really hard bit of late wood and then suddenly it's going to shift really quickly through the early wood and you, you just get a rough finish. So if you're doing, for example, um, finger joints or dovetails, much easier to work if you've got a really tight grain. Okay, so we've picked out something. So I've reached for a smoothing plane to get rid of those ripples. And you can hear the plane, it jumps as it goes over those ripples. And it's jumping because it's not quite flat. But they're really quite thin shavings, very easy to push through there. And basically we got rid of all the ripples on that side as quickly as that. You will still want to check that it's flat. You could check at that point for uh, straightness, in, straightness in its length. There's a little bit 
a bow in there, a very small bit. But before we worry too much about that, I've got a straight edge. I'll just square an edge to that uh, side. It should have come out of plain square, so hopefully, just by cleaning off the ripples, we're not going to affect the squareness of it. But we'll check that anyway. So that's looking good. So we've got a nice flat smooth edge and face side. So we can then take our dimensions off. Now the other thing I'll say is if you're getting more than one length out of a piece of your lumber, I'd probably split it down as long as those lengths are, are longer than about a foot or you know eight, nine, ten inches or longer. Cut it down first because if you've got any slight um, bow in the wood, you could be shooting that bow to try and get rid of it for a lot longer if you leave it in its full length. So first thing perhaps would be to cut it into the sizes you want. Now you don't want to go exactly to the size you want because you're going to want to square off the ends. So leave a little bit at each end. You probably don't have to worry too much about uh, splits at the end of the wood from a DIY store but if I, my component say is 10 inches long it sounds as if there's some buffering problems going on I do apologize for that I have no idea what's going on I think it's it's worked okay in the past So I've got roughly a 10 inch section marked on there, roughly marked. We'll add a little bit at both ends and I'll just cut that in half. You can use probably quite a coarse saw at this point because you're really just roughly taking it to length. And I shall just grab a little bench hook, can you see at this end of the bench? Not quite. I'm using a Japanese saw, it's uh, a medium cut on, on this one. And you'll see I'm, I'm not putting any knife wall on there. If you've heard of a knife wall for rough cutting, you probably don't really want to bother about that. So I'll discard that piece and we'll work with the length that we're trying to prepare. So we have this length, it's a little bit longer than we want, uh, it's a little bit thicker uh, and a little bit wider. So how do we get to exactly what we want? We'll leave the length till last. We've got the nicely flattened and smooth, almost straight I think we said. I've got a slight bow in it there. So a little bit extra on these ends on the top. So I'll just take some stop shavings from the ends. Let's set it just a little bit thick. Stop shavings at both ends, just took a bit of height away. A couple of sets of through shavings. Have to flatten that out. 
That's better. Now that should sit flat on the bench as we take the slight crown that it had <coughs> out of the other side. So it's a little bit crowned on there. So a little bit high in the middle. And it's a little bit high in this area. So we'll take some shavings just in the middle. And then some through shavings. That's looking nice and straight. I'll wind my iron back and just smooth that side as well. When setting my smoother on most planes, I'll just use a little strip of hardwood just so I can gauge the position of the iron, which is very slightly cambered. So the camber or the curve of the iron is right in the middle of the plane now. And it's taking a thinner cut. And what I'll do is I'll take a, a shaving or th three sets of shavings working across the board. And I've got a feeling that my uh, lever cap is a little bit loose. I think my arm is just moving a little bit. I sharpened it before I started and on this one I have to <coughs> actually screw the lever cap screw down each time. Okay, uh, so a question about the planes. <clears throat> this is um, a record, four and a half, which uh, was my grandfather's. So I inherited that. All I had to do to this actually was a little bit of clean up on the sides and the sole. He'd taken a lot of care of it and it was, it was pretty good condition. The uh, number five here, which uh, I haven't used this one yet, have I? I was going to use this to shoot the ends later. It came in pretty poor condition, I think, this one. I've got three number fives. And I think they all came in reasonably rough condition. So I, uh, I've cleaned up the sides and the sole, made sure they were square or as square as could be to each other. And uh, fitted the frog a little bit better than they did at the factory. Uh, I do have videos on, on doing that. In fact, specifically, probably for that number five. So hopefully this will behave itself a little better now. It always seems to me um, horrible to work with a piece of wood that has ripples in it. So even though I... Am I using a hot blade? Yes, I am. Yeah, I didn't mention that, did I? <coughs> so yes, I replaced uh, the record blade that came with that uh, with a hot iron and chip breaker. So actually, it has been pimped a little bit, if you like. 
But on the number five, uh, you should see that's a standard Stanley blade. And as long as you get these things nice and sharp and keep them sharp, they do a very good job. The hock, I think, holds its edge a little bit longer. Um, and it can also, I can also get it as keen an edge as with the Stanley. Stanley blades can be got very keen but tend to lose their edge a little bit faster. So that's lovely and smooth. We've got one side which still isn't smooth. And I was thinking about, supposed to be talking about dimensioning, I've basically taken uh, the PAR and I've cleaned it up at the moment. I haven't done much to the dimension apart from change its length. So let's say we want to make something that's not quite as wide as this. You'd want to find yourself, and everything's going to move now because the tripod's in front of the drawers that I need to get to. Okay, I hope we're back on track. Um, I would probably use now a pencil gauge to mark the width. If it's wide, if I want to take more off here than uh, perhaps a quarter of an inch, it's probably worth sawing it rather than planing. And so let's say we're going to do it there. So mark it with a pencil. I'm marking that a little bit wider. So this measurement here is a little bit wider than I want, but uh, fairly close so I can creep up to the, <coughs> the actual dimension uh, using a plane. So now I'll take that back to the vise in this case. I think that would be the easiest one to saw it vertically with a Japanese saw. Same saw, different edge of it. So we have cross cut and ripped teeth on here. Starting a rip cut with uh, these large teeth can always be a little bit of a challenge. in the right place <clears throat> but because I've kept it shy of what the finish thick is I can now plane down and bring that surface nice and level and actually I'll use this number five <clears throat> when you're dimensioning a piece of wood it's good to have a plane which is roughly the same sort of length or a little bit shorter or longer does it make any sense, does it? It's good to have a plane which is almost as long or longer rather than one which is very short. So I could easily do this with a number four or four and a half, but I'll do it with a number five. I want to bring that down roughly square. I can see it isn't at the moment. And you can see how fast the uh, you can plane down with a nice sharp blade. 
So that's why I say if you're close to the dimension that you've, you've bought in the first place, then you can avoid sawing entirely. When I get to this stage, I will set the width using a cutting gauge, which is a knife poking through here. You can use a, a marking gauge as well, but that would have a pin rather than a blade. Try and make it easy for myself and keep it pretty close to where I am. Okay, okay, question through. <coughs> you have to repeat the first one, Shrenik, but uh, the second point was if I started the stream with the camera horizontal, it would have remained uh, horizontal for the stream rather than going portrait mode. Um, I tried to actually, and you might have noticed the stream was a little bit late going to air. I was trying to start it with the camera horizontal and I was having problems, but I put the camera vertical, I was still having problems. Is that right? I think that was right. Uh, but I was still having problems. Went back, stopped something on the laptop, and then things started working, uh, and I ended up uh, streaming it in this orientation. <clears throat> I'm not sure if turning it around at the moment will make any difference. What do you think? Anyone? Prob I think it, is, it wouldn't make any difference now, but it certainly start the stream. Okay. We'll try that next time for sure. Honing plate for natural, a diamond plate to hone natural <coughs> stone. Okay, a lap, a lapping plate. Okay. Can I recommend a lapping plate for um, Japanese water stones or natural stone sharpening, sharpening stones? Um, I've only tried one, so it would be unfair for me to say it's the best one and um, there is a review of it on my channel so i would suggest you look at that um, i haven't used it since i did the review because I, I haven't needed to and as i say i haven't tried other ones so i'm not going to say that it's the best it worked that's all i can really tell you i can tell you the name i think pretty quickly Yeah, the name of it was Maffalo, M-A-F-F-A-L-O. And uh, yeah, that did the job. But uh, I also believe coarse, any coarse diamond plate would do the same job as well. Okay, before I go around with the cutting gauge, I'm just going to check for square <coughs> on all the edges. And it is slightly off square, so let's just square that up first. I'm going to bring another number five in now, if I can find it. Oh no, that wasn't the one, that's the other one. Okay, so I use a, a camber blade in this number five, which allows me to square things up because I can by moving the position of the plane across the, the edge, I'll take a thicker shaving towards the middle of the blade. So if this edge was higher than this edge, um, I set the centre of the plane onto the high edge. And I'll take a thicker shaving on that side. So uh, a couple of thick shavings from that side, thinner towards that side. <clears throat> one with the blade going down the middle that will have made an adjustment whether it's quite enough I don't know all 
almost there. And it's at this point that uh, I establish what is my reference side and face. So I'm checking off <coughs> this face side against that face edge and they're square. So I'll just put a mark on there to remind me <coughs> they're my reference faces. So now I'll check thickness from here to here and remove any extra thickness from this side and I'll check um, width from here to here removing the excess from this side. So with my gauge set to the width I want, make sure I locked it down, I can gauge that round. And then I'm shooting with the plane towards that uh, gauge line. You probably can't see that, but it's thicker. <coughs> the, the amount I've got to remove is thicker at this end than it is at that end. It's often the case when you use a pencil gauge, you don't get it spot on. So my sawing was, <coughs> well, actually my sawing wasn't spot on, was it? So perhaps I should blame my sawing rather than the pencil gauge. So I need to remove more from this end than that end, basically, is the first thing to say. So let's start by correcting that error with some stop shavings. So removing shavings here, lifting the plane so we're not removing any down there. And we can check that by putting some pencil marks along there. So they're removed here, they still remain at the other end. One all the way through, just to tidy things up a bit. Check my gauge line. It's almost there at this end, still got a way to go down here. I will check that I'm close to square, and whilst I'm planing down to that line, I can correct that squareness. It's now virtually square. <coughs> I've got a very small amount to remove this end. There's still a little bit more to remove at this end. looks very good. I need my glasses to check that but it's a uh, it looks good. It's square. I'll grab the old glasses. Okay I've got just a little bit in the middle so I've got a slight hump in the middle. So I'll take care of that by doing a stop shaving just in the middle, leaving both ends. It always tends to be um, when you're planing something that the, it will end up with a hump in the middle. I don't know why it is, but uh, a lot of people will tell you that. It seems to be the case. Okay, that looks good. Still square, so we've got the right width, um, almost the right length. Thickness, not quite the right thickness. So what I would do now,
probably just plane down to, to where I want to get to, depending on how thick it is. But remember, we've selected the timber to be close to what we want. So I'm going to assume that we really just want to take a little bit off in the thickness. And I'll do that again with the plane. Now here, this is roughly a plain iron width. So we could take shavings right the way across. But uh, I'm using the camber blade to take a reasonable sort of medium thickness shaving off it. It would be easier if I do one stroke each side and finish off with one in the middle. Now thinking about planing direction as well, I haven't bothered too much with this. It's um, planing reasonably well in either direction. The easiest thing that I would recommend is try planing it before you get anywhere near your finished dimension and find out which way it planes best. And then stick with that unless things change. So this would be the same process as doing the, the thickness, we'd gauge a line round, plane down to that line. If it was thicker one end than the other, then we'd do stop shavings. If it was humped in the middle, stop shavings, leaving both ends. And we'll assume now that we've got to the thickness we want, the width we want, and now we just need to tidy up for the length. This is where a marking knife comes in with the set square using our reference edge. So we'll tidy up one end first. We know roughly how much excess we've got. So we'll mark that around. I'm struggling with my hands at the moment with arthritis, so this is quite a painful process. <clears throat> Remember to always use the, the stock of the square on one of the reference faces. If you've actually thicknessed and uh, squared up the edges as you've gone, it really shouldn't make a difference. But uh, if you've got a slight error in there, you might find, up that, find out that when you get round with your marking line, it doesn't actually match up. Success. So I don't want to play that. It's end grain for a start. It's going to be reasonably difficult. Uh, it'd be much easier if I saw that. This is where uh, what's commonly called now a knife ball or a knifed ball. Use a uh, chisel. Can you see this end? Yes, you can. Use a chisel just uh, from the waist, slightly angled down towards the base of the knife line. Just remove a little, little piece of material so that your saw has somewhere to sit. Same saw, so reasonably coarse. Set that in that little valley that I've created. I start by leaning it um, towards, uh, away from the waist, towards what I want to keep, very slightly until I've started the cut, then square it up. And that makes sure there's no chance of me cutting into the material I want to keep. to a shooting board. A shooting board is basically a bench hook 
which uh, allows you to use a plane against the side of it. The plane sits on its side. The blade is set nice and square to the sole, uh, nice and square to the sides of the plane. So when the plane is on the bench top, the iron is facing vertically up. The workpiece sits against the hook, or what we call a fence in this situation. The plane can either ride on a, a board that's underneath or part of the shooting board, or as I do most of the time, uh, directly on the bench. And what we do is we put the plane up to here, we prepare the shooting board um, by running the plane along the side of it several times. The plane can't obviously cut where the iron doesn't exist down at the bottom. So there comes a point where the, the sole of the plane stops it cutting any further in that direction. So then the, the actual shooting board is controlling or is providing a jig for the plane to ride against. So the work against the fence, push it out. The fence should be at 90 degrees to the side of the, the shooting board. And you'll see I've got a little bit of paper in there. Over the course of the year, sometimes you get a very slight deviation in that squareness. And with a piece of paper, I can either shift this end out a bit, or I can shift that end out on the work a bit to correct for any slight irregularities in the fence. So no need for an adjustable fence, just a piece of paper. Okay, so the plane will slide nice and freely down here. You're no longer cutting into the shooting board. And I can just slide the, the workpiece up against the plane, hold it tight against the fence, and you see the iron cutting into the end grain there. Keep feeding the work in with each cut. And you'll see you're actually taking end grain shavings rather than just producing dust. Once we get all the way across, which again you could check with pencil, so put pencil all the way along there. Once you're taking a shaving that covers the whole of that area, then you know you're done. Actually, you can see I've set my iron slightly, slightly proud to the shooting board, so it's just touching the end of the fence. Now, what did I do with my square? Oh, check for square. See, that's lovely. Should also be lovely that way. And then all we need to do for this component is to do its actual length. So we'll take steel rule, always the best device for doing this sort of thing. Use something to abut both the workpiece and the rule to at that end, so you get it exactly in the right place. Marking knife. Mark the length. Use a square, working off the reference faces again. Transfer that length around. And I'll say it's probably not necessary to mark all the way around because you're only going to saw from one side, but actually you're cutting the fibres with the knife, which is cleaner than sawing. And if if you ended up sawing this, having not cut those fibres and you broke out a few fibres underneath on the back side of the work, you're going to be pretty annoyed with yourself. So just remember, just take that little bit of time to mark all the way around. Pop 
a knife going in as we did on the other end. Back to the bench hook, back to the saw. You see I'm, I'm moving around backwards and forwards because <coughs> I'm only working at this end of the bench. You can set yourself up, shooting board clamped to the bench, down at the other end. Bench hook always here, um, a stop for planing against, maybe halfway down the bench. So you better just move from station to station rather than have to move things around. And you could also work on a number of components all at the same time. Uh, when I say at the same time, uh, you smooth all the components, then move on to the next operation and you become a little bit more efficient in your work. Okay, so this is the final end. We just want to square that up, make sure it gets all the way to the knife line. Okay, got to the knife line, nice and square. Check its length. Its length, exactly what we wanted. Width, well, I made up what width it was going to be. We've smoothed it all round, got rid of all those ripples. We know all the corners are nice and square to each other. So right length, right thickness, right width. There's your component blank, ready to make the next part of your project. So, Shrunik, any questions come in on that? Any questions that come up so far? Um, not, not since the last ones I wrote, anyway. Um, okay. I'm just asking the chat if there are any further questions. Super. So, um, the next stream will be hopefully on uh, Wednesday evening. And I'll... Um, I'll post about that, post a notification on that um, tomorrow evening when I know exactly when I'll be able to do that. Can I swap my camera around? There we go. Yeah, I'll uh, post the notification for that tomorrow evening so you've got 24 hours notice. 7 o'clock. The only possible change might be Right, well, I can't see the question at the moment, so I'm guessing there are no questions. Okay, well, well, Shrenik, you were the one who suggested dimensioning PAR lumber. Live stream I did uh, a couple of days ago, saying that I was going to do live streams throughout the uh, the lockdown here in the UK. Um, if you've got any subjects that you'd like to do. Right, well, I'm waiting to hear back from some, I don't know how to pronounce it, Tommy for exactly what he meant by his question. Something about a secret, um, secret dovetail drawer. Uh, I didn't know whether he meant a secret mitre dovetail drawer. I know, I know that, yes. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that's suitable for a live stream. That would take rather a long time to do. But I can talk about it. I've still got a demonstration joint, which I believe is uh, able to be disassembled and shown. Which is very 
<laughs> it is. Do you know how many of those I've done? <laughs> Well, let's just say you could count it on my thumbs. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's a possibility. I can always uh, give that a go. Uh, it might end up being a bit of a laugh. But uh, the, the one I did for the video, which was the second one I ever did, uh, came out all right. So why not? Isn't a secret might to dovetail a waste of time unless anyone used uh, one in a real piece of furniture? And from the point of view of making it, Cosman has uh, a whole lot of, um, what should we say, pride in his work, uh, doing it the way the old folks used to do it. Um, I've used it in... Um, so it used... Uh, I do see your point. Uh, with the machines available these days, well, you can just knock out what looks like secret mitre dovetail from the outside. So basically just a mitre joint, which has got as much strength. The point of view of being a hand tool woodworker and a mostly unplugged woodworker, uh, if somebody comes to me and commissions a piece, um, I'll offer them the option. Do you want me to spend the time it takes to do that? Or do you want me to do that particular part of it um, with power tools like a domino or something like that? Um, and occasionally the person who's buying it is uh, very positive about having the real craftsmanship in the piece and will say, yes, let's have that. Uh, but I must admit, most of the time they say, I'll have whichever is cheapest as long as it looks like on the outside, <laughs> which is a shame, but it's undoubtable. Okay, <laughs> jolly good. Uh, I'll move a little bit close to the house, so maybe the internet will get a bit better. Um, no suggestions on there tonight, then, for the next video or one in the future. And that'll make life really easy for me, because nobody's got any questions, nobody's got any suggestions. Uh, then I can just come on and say hello and goodbye and go and enjoy the rest of my evening. <laughs> no? Okay, well... Thanks for joining me tonight. Uh, it's run on longer than I thought it would. Uh, we did have some technical problems. Um, I am really new to this, as Srenik can, uh, can vouch. And so far, I think we've always had one problem or other. Uh, but one of these days, we'll get it absolutely right. So thanks for all for watching. Thank you so much, Srenik, in passing over the chat messages to me. And uh, see you all again next time. Cheerio.